and to figure out how to. Kino is still not working, yeah? Connecting the audio, it looks like. <clears throat> I think we're live, but let's see. Yeah, like so. All right. Hi, guys. Hey. There we go. Keenan's hey. in. Hey, Keenan. Hi, everyone. Hi. How are you? Can you hear me properly? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, uh, we're live now, by the way. Uh, I think uh, the connection with Kino is not so good, actually. Um, let's, uh, let's see. All right, let's start. Um, this uh, live stream is about uh, ACL rehab. Uh, we will have a, a bunch of questions, of course, and a few. Uh, uh, Kino and Charlie are, are treating a lot of ACL um, rehab patients, so they will be interesting. And uh, Kiara and me will be the question, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, asking the questions. Um, let's uh, first uh, have a little introduction of everybody. Um, I am Niels Outhuis from uh, the, uh, the Netherlands, um, created the Trust Me, I'm a Physiotherapist, and also Trust Me Ed, uh, online educational platform. And um, yeah, this, uh, this, uh, these, are, these live streams are open discussions to uh, try to learn from each other and uh, focus on practical tips instead of uh, the boring theory. Uh, it's be always better to talk about case studies and uh, more the practical side. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go with Chiara first. Um, hi everyone, I'm Chiara. Uh, I am working out of Sydney. Um, I've been a physio for about two years now, so still kind of new grad territory. Um, dealing mostly with musculoskeletal injuries. Um, I have a lot of interest for, I used to have a lot of interest for the knee. I still do, but I'm born to kind of shoulder, shoulder injuries now. Um, I mostly deal with a mixed caseload of general kind of neck pain, back pain, all of that. Um, but I also really like working with uh, hobbyists or all the way to athletes. Um, and I see lots of people doing jujitsu because I train jujitsu myself um, and there's lots of injuries involved in the sport. But yeah, I've, I've had a, a bit of experience with ACL. So uh, I can maybe share the little bits that I've learned, but I'm mostly here to ask some questions as well. I hear in the, like a beep from a, like a chat, I think. Uh, so if somebody can uh, take that off. Is that mine, you mean? I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one it is. Somebody, I think it's like a, like a mobile phone um, buzzer or something. Kino, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Kinan Khatib. I'm um, I'm a physical therapist um, specialized in sports rehab out of Beirut, Lebanon. <clears throat> I've been working uh, in the in the sports field for almost um, five six years now, uh, and I've been working as a physical therapist for almost uh, seven eight years now. Um, uh, I started off uh, with my. Uh, I'm actually working with a, in a facility that treats athletes in Lebanon uh, and amateurs as well. Uh, I'm I'm a bas also a professional basketball player, which uh, and I'm specialized in uh, basketball rehab. And I'm 29 years old. And Charlie, um, I'm a, a musculoskeletal physio. I've been working for 12 years. Um, I have my own practice in London um, called Better and also work at Pure Sports Medicine uh, for the past four years. I've been treating most, most of my ACL experience has probably been since joining Pure Sports Medicine. I see quite a lot of post-ops as a result of the consultant networks that we have there. Um, but in that period, I've probably seen over 100, I would say, ACLs in total uh, from sort of 
some some operative some non-op so quite good variety of different types of acl rehab um a very close friend of mine andy goodall who's uh, online as sports knee physio most of you might, might know him if you're if you're interested in these i went on his course as well recently he's just launched an acl course which is um which is really informative as well so um yeah good i've got a good background on acls and um yeah getting on a little bit now as a physio at 35 so um yeah feel feel fairly comfortable in this topic and looking forward to having a good chat i think i'm the most uh, the oldest here 37 so uh, <laughs> but, uh let's start uh, maybe first of all already um would you uh, what are your criteria or maybe charlie is, is the best for this what are your criteria to choose if it should be surgically or um, um, conservatively? Uh, I it, think a lot of it is... I know Keenan is working as, uh, mainly yeah. with surgical uh, ACL patients. <clears throat> or maybe we can yeah. talk about it. I think the biggest part of it is patient preference. Um, there's, there's certain people who will do better than others, uh, but presenting the information in a really clear way to them at the start is is really important uh there's that the, at the moment there is a lot a lot of uncertainty about the arthritis development whether people that have acl do end up going on to have less arthritis or, or maybe even not as some of the more recent research is suggesting so that it does bring in the option of a conservative management for many people and what most people don't understand is really the the challenge of going through an ACL rehab journey, which is way more, way harder than most people are able to really commit to, especially when they're not an athlete and not being paid to rehab. So it's something that I'll get across really clearly to them at the start if they've had an ACL injury is that if it is an isolated ACL injury and there's no other pathology involved, maybe no, no meniscus, no MCL, they have a, a, a an isolated ACL and they are not very good in the gym they've not got a background in 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 exercise perhaps or or at least not a very comprehensive background if if that's the case then i'd start giving them the option of the the non-operative management is faster they're likely to cope and even if they end up not being a coper they can still have a delayed operation so i tend to try and encourage them to start their rehabilitation process as if they're going to try and cope and if they're having instability episodes further down the line then they they can have it then and their outcomes as far as we can tell don't end up being any worse so um it's well worth people who are slightly intimidated or don't have that that the, um that exercise uh, um, experience to try the rehabilitation process first and if it's not an isolated aco with uh, other meniscus tear or whatever what would you do then it starts to become more about stabilizing the knee surgically, um, but it's still not as clear cut. There may still be candidates who would like to try non-operatively first. If they have a, an MCL and an ACL, for example, they may may do well with a brace to try and get the MCL to heal. And then then you'll if the MCL heals, then you have a, a primary, primary ACL to, to deal with. So it does make it a bit less black and white for them. They that it will be more about what the consultant recommends in those situations. But I'm pretty comfortable in an isolated ACL to be counselling them towards being a coper initially if they've got that um, lack of experience in exercise, uh, really being clear about what it takes and what it requires from them. And then if um, so certainly because I think some surgeons are still a bit behind on this as well. I think some surgeons are still thinking very, very much operatively for everyone and telling them that the main reason for that is is the arthritis risk. I know some some of the consultants I'm dealing with are are talking more openly about it, which is great. But I still get people that say that they have an isolated ACL and their surgeon has said that they should have surgery to limit arthritis um, development. So there are still mixed messages coming from different parts of our uh, of medicine so it, it's I, I just see it as my job to offer them an alternative way of thinking if they're thinking ACL operation and maybe they they're not aware of those uh, the connotations of how how hard it is how challenging it is how long it takes uh, I just give them the option what do you think you well I totally agree with the uh, with what uh, Charlie said um 
First of all, we, we, we have to talk about the evidence that's uh, and the research that has been done lately on these types of, um, uh, on this subject, actually. Uh, but I, what I think is that the patient preference is the, and his objectives are what his goals are. So depending on if he's an athlete or an amateur, with, it depends on, on his goals and it depends on his le activity level. That, that's how, and he's the only one in the end to decide whether it's, for, it's a surgical treatment or a conservative, conservative treatment that he's going to follow. Um, uh, of course, the research lately has, uh, uh, of course, we have to understand as well, um, the medical, doc the, the, surg uh, the, the surgeon's point of view, and we have to understand also, in order to be uh, fair and blunt, uh, the, uh, he, for example, here in Lebanon and in the Middle East, they always go for the surgical treatment. But you have to know why. You have to know. You have to understand why they go for this. But because it's it's more uh, uh, financially, uh, it's 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 better financially for the doctors to go for the surgical treatment. And this is and I'm, here. I'm being more blunt, and I'm being straightforward. So you have, we have to understand that sometimes it's a, it's a matter of money than a matter of health uh, for the doctor. <clears throat> it's a matter for him uh, how many surgeries can he do in one day so he can make more money in a day than for uh, then looking out for the for the people's for, for people's needs and people's health. So uh, there are some doctors that are like this, some surgeons that are like this. I'm not generalizing, but there are some surgeons that I work with that are not like this, that would prefer going for the conservative, conservative treatment depending on the patient's preferences and depending on the patient's activity level and goals. So uh, the, the research lately has, been, uh, has proven that uh, the conservative treatment works as well. Uh, it may take a bit longer. If we are in a hurry for an athlete to go back, for him to go back on court, if we're talking about an athlete here, we might go for a, for a surgical treatment. It depends also on his uh, activity level. But if he's, if he's using uh, the, uh, the change of direction, if, he's a, if it's a contact sport, so we have to study depending on each case. We have to study the, the case and we have to study the, 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 the patient and then we'll decide and he will decide what, what's best for him. Of course, after getting our uh, professional advice. So that's my opinion. I think what's interesting, yeah, Keenan, I, I think what's interesting as well is there are some um, athletes that go back as a COPA even sooner than the surgical candidates as well. That yeah. it's And there's not many, there's a few cases, but there are some elite athletes out there that are performing at elite levels of performance with no ACL and they're doing fine, they're doing great. So there's, uh, and there's also the, the next complicated part, which is we're starting to see that some ACLs are growing back, <laughs> which yeah. we, we never thought was, was possible. Charlie, so, we, were, so we were talking yesterday yeah. about this, Niels and, uh, yeah. and Kara and I. Yeah, we were talking about this, about this, uh, the, the, this actually paper, this research that has been talking that this, even without surgical treatment, uh, the ACL is being repaired, yeah. it's going back, so yeah. uh, which is phenomenal. So, uh, and there are athletes that are playing with uh, in a conserv following a conservative treatment without surgical treatment, and they are playing professionally and they are doing really well. But those kind of people, uh, for example. Uh, if you, I don't know, uh, guys, if you've heard about it, about Zlatan Ibrahimovic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, he played, uh, I think, without an ACL for the uh, for the AC Milan uh, season, uh, the whole season, and he was practicing, I think, without the ACL, without his ACL, if I'm not mistaken, and I he, believe he, he was using all the way, all, all the well. time, physiotherapy. Yeah, yeah, and he he used yeah, to uh, fusion, he used to yeah, like this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so uh, he worked a lot on his uh, on his uh, with his physical therapist and with his personal trainer and athletic trainer, and eventually they won the 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 La, La Liga, I think. So yeah. uh, so this is this to show this is to show you that, but in the end he went for the surgical treatment uh, in the end because he he's used to kind of, uh, some kind of uh, a play that he, he he's uh, he's comfortable playing uh, in a way that he, he you know when you when you when you tear your ACL there's always an, in the athlete I'm talking there's always this kind of nagging. Um, uh, nagging a person talking to you in your head like there's something in your knee there's something in your knee even if you're playing even if you're following this conservative treatment and some athletes prefer not to prefer to play without this nagging voice in their head so they always that's why they always go for the surgical treatment mm -hmm. in a, this is the name, the name of the athlete Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Zlatan, 
Yeah. Zlatan if, I, yeah. if I remember rightly, though, he had a pretty big effusion throughout most of that journey. And the reason he didn't have the surgery was so that he could finish the season rather than necessarily because he he wanted to be a coper. Um, so mm. so his his example is probably not one I would be <laughs> recommending to most yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, most people, because if you've got a massive knee effusion and, and you, that that would to me suggest you're not coping. And and you would you yeah. shouldn't be performing in in exercise like football for example. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean it still shows what what the body's capable of. And, and and an athlete like Zlatan who can who's you know step above most most athletes and in uh, in performance anyway, you can get away with it. What do you yeah. think, Kiera? No, I was I was actually gonna say and then also ask. Um, because I think there's a lot of value in figuring out who are the copers and the non-copers. And um, it's funny because people say, okay, if you're an athlete, go down the surgical way, mostly because they don't have the kind of uh, opportunity to test if they're a coper and then add on to their rehab after surgery and all of that. But technically, if you know, you could identify that with a pretty good certainty, you end up with athletes that could actually you know participate in the game again without having to worry about their hamstring graft or wherever they got the graft from and like whether the ACL took and you know you have to kind of do the nine month minimum to really kind of be sure that the ACL has been accepted and is, is really you know uh, strengthening up again and can actually withstand the, the force I think there has been studies correct me if I'm wrong that have shown that if you don't sit out the nine month period um, and do the rehab for the nine month period, you have worse outcomes usually um, than if you wait for that time. So there's probably a lot of value in actually really figuring out what, what makes the one person accept the conservative rehab really well, because it would actually allow the athletes to get back to play sooner and stronger. Um, so I guess my question for both Charlie and Keenan are what, what are your, um, I know that there's coping like coper uh, criteria currently, but what is kind of the thing that you mostly look out for, um, both in your experience as well as the evidence? For me, it would be any evidence of instability. So either episodes of giving way, um, at least sometimes even just one big one, or, or but, but normally kind of more than one episodes of giving way. But the other part that's that's equally important for me is their sensation of stability. How do they their perception of how stable their, their knee feels to them? Because you can normally get through the first block of of um, of rehab fairly comfortably, where you're it's almost like the prehab part where you're just building some strength back up, getting the knee settled, getting it straight, getting it to bend again. You can normally get through that part with most people fairly comfortably. But it's as you then step onto the next phase where it's a bit more dynamic, a little bit more challenging, starting to look at them on single leg. It's at that stage that you would you would be able to pick out whether they're coping or not, and they would have a pretty good feel for that too. So, and, and there's obviously the, the kind of in between patients where they're re really reluctant and they don't want to give it more time, and that's fine. But if, if they're leaning towards surgery, they're almost certainly going to have surgery anyway, and then. It's it's kind of any episode of, of of a perception or a giving way moment that would would make the decision for, or at least not necessarily make the decision for me, but make me kind of counsel them to say, okay, you now have the option of both. Where do you want to go? Yeah, the same Are thing. Yes, measures whether it's like a questionnaire or like a not a hop test or anything like that. The the ACL RSI. Um, is pretty a pretty good questionnaire that, that that works quite well and and that's got a lot of psychological components to it about their confidence and and their ability or and their, and their their functional abilities and also their confidence so it is quite a good one to to suss out whether they're in a good place or not i can't remember the exact numbers for it but there's there's definitely some data out there that gives you a, a metric of whether you'd be comfortable with them going back into sport or not for example uh, I use that whether they're a copa or, or whether it's um, non-surgical or surgical. Cool. Are you keen on? Uh, well, for me, if I if I'm in front of my patient and I'm asking and he's asking me what do I go for, I'm like 
I tell them like this is your decision in the end. I give them the both of the um, uh, both of uh, the options because in my in my in my own experience, I do not like to influence the patient's decision because in the end, if I influence him, if I lean him towards one option, uh, he's gonna and if it doesn't work, he's gonna come in the end and tell me like you 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 told me to go for this option and it didn't work. So in the end, I ask him I I ask him to take the decision, his own decision. And he's and being and being convinced with the decision because, uh, uh, like Charlie said, if he's if he's leaning towards the surgical uh, treatment, he's gonna probably go for the surgical treatment in the end. So uh, I I do not decide. That, of course, I I I cannot. Uh, I give him some advices. I give him uh, what I uh, the pros and cons of each decision. And but in the end, it's his uh, decision, and uh, I, I do not, I do not try to influence him as well. Is this with just the athletes, or also with like your person coming in who's like a hobbyist? Um, or yeah, maybe- yeah. I just had, I just had a, a hobbyist that c- came in like a month ago. Uh, I think, and he tore his ACL while playing. Like he's a, he's a, we call them a weekend athletes. So he's the he's the kind of guy that uh, that uh, that gathers his friends and they they go play basketball. They rent a, a court and they play basketball here. So uh, he tore his ACL while playing. This uh, one time he he hadn't even played uh, for like a year or so basketball. So I told him uh, we can go for the conservative treatment, but he he came convinced he came to me when he first came to me he came convinced to do the surgery and he asked all of the questions related to the surgery so i didn't influence him i told him that you know that there is the conservative treatment and the uh, and the evidence and the research has proven that it's been working a lot and it's the acl is even growing back uh, you don't need to go through the surgical treatment he told me even about the osteoarthritis uh, consequence or uh, uh, i t- because you know some some of them they they come and they do they they're doing their own research so uh, uh you cannot even uh, talk to them you cannot even try to convince them because they're already convinced so i try not to influence them and i, I go with the with the option that they choose i mean i see the value in that but i say like when i i, I would and i have in the past like i have presented both the options to them but especially if they are presented as a coper I, I feel like in the end, they are coming to you for your expert kind of recommendation, right? So I feel like there is value in saying like, at the end, it is your choice. It is obviously like a teamwork effort. But um, the studies have like the kind of gold standard recommendation, seemingly, at least for the weak warrior, um, seems to be that they should at least try the conservative rehab first because delayed surgery or early surgery hasn't really shown to have any different outcomes so I feel like there is value in in maybe saying I want to get the surgery you can still get the surgery but maybe let's try a bit of a conservative approach uh, first but maybe I'm, I'm just biased in that way as well because I think um, when I came out of uni a lot of the ACL was blowing up in in, in terms of like oh my god it can heal like all the studies are coming out people were just kind of changing their minds so conservative was like the new fad um at the time might change yeah i'm with you yeah i'm with you kiara i think giving them the option and just suggesting that there's nothing lost by delaying a little bit they'll just end up going in if they if they get to the point where they're not quite coping but but then they're nearly there they have the operation then their knee is likely really settled they've got no swelling they've got got straight knee they've got good strength they're going to bounce out of the surgery better anyway so yeah i agree as long as they're not in a huge rush and they're hoping to avoid some surgery i think that that approach is quite a good one to follow but also expectations are also very important of course if if somebody has an expectation that surgery is the good is the thing you can talk whatever but it won't uh, change anybody absolutely yeah and by the way, uh, so you know, I'm I'm also with you guys. I go, I I prefer delaying uh, uh, the surgical treatment as much as I can. But what what I found out is that, and we're living in a fast world now nowadays. So uh, everyone is in a hurry. I don't know why, but yeah. uh, they they wanna they wanna go back. They just wanna go back and they wanna <coughs> buy <coughs> buy time as much as they can. 
So uh, for them, if it's easier to go for the surgical treatment and uh, uh, way less, more, uh, much more less time, so they, they go they go for this and and not for the not for the conservative treatment because if they tell you they tell you if I want to go for the conservative treatment now for like nine months or a year I'm gonna I'm gonna lose a year if it doesn't work so uh, this is this is the perception of it this is how they take it but still after the surgery they also need like nine months of of uh, rehab right exactly I, I'd, I'd correct yeah. you there I'd say I'd say 12 months the athletes athletes are a rare breed and just as I mentioned earlier they get paid to rehab most of our yeah. patients do not get paid to rehab they have to find their own time they have a job they have yeah. sometimes family there's lots going on it's really tough to stay on track every single month of that journey so i i'm much more realistic and just say look just give it 12 you're, you're unlikely yeah. to be ready in, in nine months if you want to get back to a change of direction sport so you, you you'll be fairly active during that time so it's not like you can't exercise for 12 months but if you're thinking about a return to some form of competitive change of direction sport skiing football whatever it might be it's much more likely to be 12 and it might even be longer i have patients that i'm still rehabbing now that are 15 18 months down the line because they're just not quite quite ready yet and that's based on my fit my metrics and also the, the acl rsi questionnaire and also their feeling they just don't quite feel ready yet it's normally the ones who have had um multiple multiple injuries so not just acl it's normally the ones who have had maybe acl mcl meniscus uh, I've even got one who had bilateral, like lateral, mani la medial and lateral meniscal root repair. And, and his just took so long at the start because it was a really big operation he needed, more swelling, more pain, and it just delayed things. He's in a brace for 12 weeks. So once they have all these complicated factors, you, we, we should be realistic that they're going to take longer. And if we say that at the start, they're not disappointed when it gets to nine, 12 months and they're still not there yet. They know, they understand, they're kind of with you on the, on the journey. They know it's going to be tough. So just trying to remember that an ACL isn't just an ACL. It's got other things that could go wrong, other things that can can happen around it. And based on those things, the prognosis is different. Very good points. It's interesting. I find that um, people, a lot of the time, they think surgery is just going to solve their problem. And to actually be like, no, surgery is the hard way. Like the mm. rehab app, a lot of hard work. Yeah. Um, so I think emphasizing that to someone and being like surgery isn't the easy option here. It's actually a long journey. Um, yeah. Super important. And mm. I was thinking, um, do you have some tips on how to um, how to uh, keep people busy and act uh, active and rehabbing in that long period? Because it's pretty, it's a big challenge, I would say. Yeah, make sure they have a rehab holiday scheduled in. Oh, yeah. They have to have a rehab holiday, <laughs> yeah, they know, at least to. one, probably two. You know, mate. Just you can normally sense it. I, I'm quite open with it and just say, look, at some point we're going to take a break. Um, when you feel like things are getting a bit much, or you've got stuff going on, maybe maybe you've got an actual holiday coming up and you don't want to be rehabbing there. It's okay. You know, we build up ahead of steam. Take a break. It's a bit like tapering anyway. People always taper in training. I think tapering in rehab is absolutely fine. If they're, if they're going well and they're struggling psychologically, take a break. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree with Char. Yeah, actually, it's. I'm gonna write that down. I like that. It's a good one. It keeps the motivation up. I'm assuming. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. And it is something to look forward to. Also, a lot of people are already looking forward to their actual holiday, so that helps. Yeah, and yeah that's a good one. Yeah, sure. It's a reward as well because you're saying, "Well done." You're actually complimenting them, saying, "Well done. You've done great." We don't need to, to rush anymore. You've done a really good job. Take some time off and then you'll be ready for the next phase. It's It, it works really well. Um, how, much time off? Is, how much time off? Um, a week. A week's normally okay, I would say. If they want to take a bit more, fine. I mean, some people end up having a bit of a, an unplanned week off anyway. And you, you might just say, and they come in and they're really worried. They're like, oh no, I missed a week. I was ill. Or I had a lot of stuff going on. I missed a week. You're like, don't worry, it's fine. You can have a rehab holiday and let's just call that one your rehab holiday and let's just push again now you won't have lost anything in that time you might not have progressed but you don't lose anything in a week really so um, yeah. you're just trying to be realistic that these aren't professional athletes again you know it's okay you have a life to live I mean let's be all let's be honest with ourselves have we ever been fully compliant with our own rehab when we've been injured probably not so <laughs> our patients are the same our patients are the same you just got to go easy on them I, I used to get really I used to take it personally when my patients weren't doing the rehab or they, uh, 
but now i'm just like no judgment for me <laughs> if you don't do it you don't do it it's fine we'll just either adapt it it might be my fault it might be that i've pushed them too hard and i've given them too much so just much more realistic now and just make sure that it works for them and if they're falling off track then just help them back on i'm i i, I see myself now more like a, a physio coach than a physiotherapist it's like i'm just coaching them yeah it's not it's not so much that i'm doing all the stuff for them or, or, or like a physio life coach yeah it, <laughs> let's go with it trademark <laughs> we, we, we go for everything yeah we do everything practically yeah, yeah. even a psychologist sometimes Absolutely. so yeah, yeah so, so i'm just a bit more realistic and, and laid back about whether people do what they need to do or not and, and just present them with everything i think is right for them and then if it doesn't work that's okay well it's very nice yeah because it uh, relieves your pressure on yourself because especially in new grads i think they have a lot of pressure on themselves they have to be the expert the patient uh, thinks they're the expert but they feel they're not the expert and that uh, puts a lot of pressure on your shoulders then and if mm. you think indeed you're a coach you're helping somebody guiding through the process of course with your knowledge and your the skills that uh, this easier is better for you i think yeah yeah in and well, I, I had a question uh, yeah. for you i know this is like from yesterday when we were speaking about um how a lot of the time the athletes that you see have to get uh scans right away so you're talking yeah. about I will kind of determine the the ACL injury rather than like the Lockman's test or an anterior drawer or anything like that. Um, what's your criteria for, and, and I mean, maybe give a bit of background again. I, I didn't explain it as well as you did, yeah. but essentially what's the criteria? If you see an injury on the field, at what point are you like, I'm going to send you for a scan? And at what point are you like, no, it's fine. Okay, so um, let's just explain what's, what's the background of this uh, talk. So um, a lot of uh, people, uh, I, I treat, uh, I play, I'm at the uh, basketball, I am in basketball first divisions uh, the therapist. So actually what I do is that I'm on court uh, management uh, therapy. So what I do is that, um, I, I follow them uh, all, year, all year long and I treat all of their injuries. And if their injury happened on the court, um, I, uh, I step in to help them out and see what, what to do. So basically what we see lately, uh, not lately, before, like 20 years ago, what they used to do is that even if, if an athlete had an ACL rupture, partially partial rupture or complete rupture, what they do is that they go on court in order to see what's happening, to diagnose what's happening. They go for they do the Lachman test or the anterior drawer test immediately on court. And it has been proven also, and I've seen it happening that, uh, and I've seen, a, I've heard a lot of players saying to me that uh, my physio tore, completely tore my ACL by doing those tests on court. So actually what happens is that uh, that maybe the ACL is not fully ruptured, it's partially ruptured. And what happens is that therapist comes also feeling a lot of pressure from the team, from the coach, from the, cl uh, from the club's owner, from the manager, uh, asking, asking them, asking him what, what's happening. Uh, uh, we want a diagnosis. Can he go back, especially if it's, a, if it's an important player to the team? If, can he go back to play? What can we do? So uh, there, here there are two options. It's either he does under pressure. It's either he does... Three options actually. It's either he does those tests, uh, and sometimes some, the the inconvenience about this is that sometimes he ruptures the the therapist ruptures the completely ruptures the ACL for the for the athlete. And I hear it, I heard it a lot of times from the players, from the athletes, telling me that my therapist tore my ACL. It wasn't completely torn. Now it's it was it was torn after he did his uh, his test, uh, and they know and they can feel it because of the pain. They can feel a, a complete rupture. Like if you ask an athlete, what's a, a difference? Uh, tell me about a difference. The same athlete in one knee, he has a partially uh, rupture or in the same knee, he has a partially ruptured uh, ACL and then he completely uh, uh, ruptures his ACL. He will tell you that there's a big difference pain wise uh, uh, in, in, in a with a complete and a partial uh, rupture in ACL. So uh, the second option he can do is that uh, uh, he can, he can uh, choose to get him back in uh, on court, which is sometimes very wrong uh, if he's suspecting an ACL injury. And 
the, there's more stress on the on the on the ligament because he because the therapist is feeling uh, stress and pressure from the from the club to get back this player on court mm -hmm. and the third option he can take him out of the game and go for the scan uh, for an mri uh, and scan his uh, knee uh, I prefer the third option, of course. Uh, now, nowadays, we are being taught uh, and we are teaching uh, young physios not to do the tests uh, if you are suspecting an ACL injury. Just wait it out. Calm down the team owners. Uh, calm, down, calm down the coach. Calm down the manager. Uh, let them be at ease. You're the one here. You have to take, you have to be responsible. You have to take a responsible decision and you have to say like, uh, uh, now it's time to, for him to rest. If I'm suspecting something major, uh, I'm going to go and uh, uh, inspect more about uh, this injury, maybe do some scans, some MRIs, and then I'll get back to you. Uh, you just have to buy time, basically. Buying time at this in this situation is really uh, important and uh, and very crucial because uh, uh, the risk uh, the the risk here at the same time is that there's a there's an athlete between your here in your hands uh, uh, you are responsible for his knee if you are suspecting something you shouldn't play with this kind of thing so the risk reward here is like it's 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 super high the risk is super high i'd prefer to buy time to calm every, everyone down and then go for mris scan him which is the easiest way uh, and a non-risky way to to see if he's if he has a uh, an ACL rupture, partial or complete rupture. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Charlie? Do we think we're really in the, in those situations where the athlete says that they tore? Do Do you think they we're actually doing that, or that they just feel that we're doing that? And and actually, the the decision you're making there is more protecting legally and and just taking away any of the possibility of being accused of worsening. Because I find it unlikely that we're, we're going to be able to fully rupture and, and yell in that moment because it could be painful you know why, or not. Charlie? you know why well, you, know, you know why charlie for example um first of all the uh, the the sports physios for example the ones that i see that i've seen working are sometimes aggressive with those tests right. they want to see they, they it's either they're not uh, really professional and they want to be aggressive to see if there is a if there is a anterior drawer or not if, if it's uh, if the tibia is going anteriorly or not in an ACL rupture so uh the, sometimes they do it aggressively and sometimes some of them uh, uh like I, i'm telling you the the experience not my own experience but i've he i've heard it a lot especially here in, in lebanon and in the middle east i've heard i've i've heard i've heard it a lot that the athletes they come and they say uh, uh th this person tore my ACL because the, the spike of pain that they feel after being tested is uh, this is what they actually complain of that there is a spike in the pain uh, uh, level uh, after being tested that is that wasn't there for example when he it's like the, the physiotherapist doesn't go on court immediately when the athlete gets uh, gets injured you have to get you have to get for example in basketball because that's my uh, that's my sport you have to get the permission of the coach uh, to go inside it's not like this not not if it's uh, not, not not if the athlete is on the floor you go immediately in no you have to get the, the permission so the athlete stays on the ground for like a minute or two uh, it, let's say before you step in uh, deciding to help him and then when you start testing him they feel a spike in the uh, an increase in the level of pain uh, that wasn't that wasn't there and this this is when they tell me that something happened while while i was being tested so in order to be legally and health wise on the safe side we prefer not to test there is no reason take him out makes sense the risk here is too, just too high take him out of the of the, of the game Let's scan him later on. We'll find out in a couple of days maximum what's what's his uh, what's his uh, injury, and then we'll deal with it. Yeah. So this is the perfect way to deal with this kind of situations. Yeah, I do I get the legal consequences of that. I mean, yeah, exactly. Legally, it's not that good. Also, what do you think, Kira? I mean, I guess it's fair enough that you don't want to um, you don't want to misdiagnose it, like the the. Um, Lokman says, for example, isn't like super, um, is it specific? I always mix this stuff. <laughs> Sensitive. Um, and that's, so you could, specific. you could essentially, uh, false negative, but, um, I, I understand.
why you would do the the scan for that reason. I think it's more valuable to get the scan, especially at the higher level athletes that make sense to not risk it. Um, but I did have a question like, has there, have there actually been studies or any, any kind of like experiments showing, I didn't think that some, a person would have enough force to really rupture an ACL. I mean, it depends, I guess, how much of it was torn to begin with. I would imagine that if they feel a lot of pain on the field saying it, it was so much worse once they did the test, it's like, yes, of course, because they pretty much you know, put salt in a wound kind of thing. Um, so it sense that it's a lot more painful once you've actually tested it. Um, but I'm asking, is there actually, like, has it actually been no. shown? There's no. no okay. I, have, I haven't read any studies, actually. I haven't read any studies. Uh, to be fair, to say I this uh, honestly. Yeah I, yeah, I think the mechanism of injury in the player's perception is, is pretty powerful in these situations. If they're saying to you, yeah. I felt something go in my knee, you probably don't really need the tests anyway. So um, I think on balance, there's not really yeah. a, an urgent need to be doing those tests. If, you, if they're telling you something happened in my knee, you wouldn't let them play on anyway, right? You, you, you'd be removing yeah. them from the field of play. You, if they've then got a big heme arthrosis, then, you know, it's starting to look, you know, if, if it if it sounds like a, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's... Yeah. it's Especially because... Like, um, pretty useless in the in the acute phase anyways like yeah. even when someone came in did have an ACL tear I couldn't get it because they were so guarded around mm -hmm. it that you could barely the, move the knee so yeah um, yeah maybe they should but just you can see it in your, you can see it in front of you like a, swell, a swelling so uh, yeah plus you, you can see the mechanism mechanism of injury so if you see the mechanism of injury if you're following up with the game not like being distracted and doing something else that's why you have to be always uh, your eyes ha have to be like a 10 10 on the court like watching everyone seeing if, if you see the mechanism of injury how he, how he injured himself and then he grabs his knees and his knee and he tells you like something is wrong so I shouldn't I shouldn't be doing the test. But to be fair, there are no I haven't read any any uh, any research about this. But this I'm telling you, this is on the inside. And plus, uh, on on the amateur level, some people like do not go for the MRI. They go for the test for the clinical test in order to uh, for for example because the MRI is so expensive, in in, in some countries or you can, you don't have access to an MRI machine. But uh, so have to wait on, the, on, the, on the on a, on a top on a yeah, yeah. On an elite level, you have you have the money, you have uh, the you have the athlete. So why not go for the for the MRI, which is, which is uh, cheap for the for the club, you know? Uh, because the athlete at the end of the day, they are paying thousands and thousands of dollars for him to play. It's gonna it's not gonna be it's the, for for like uh, three hundred dollars. It's not gonna be uh, that expensive for them to do an MRI. So for example, here in Lebanon, the MRI costs almost like uh, three three hundred dollars, three hundred US dollars. So which isn't uh, so expensive for a club that is paying like uh, millions of dollars for their team, for their players to play. Mm -hmm. So I prefer going that way. By the way, in, um, let's uh, move to another, um, or yeah. another question. Um, which return to play uh, criteria do you use? Of course, maybe for a pro athlete, it's maybe different than a weekend warrior. But what do you think? Uh, let's uh, first uh, ask Charlie. I... Primarily use the Melbourne criteria, but but not necessarily a hundred percent. I'll be I'll be using parts of that to guide their phases, so um, just to get them towards the end in a nice structured way, and helps me to feel ready, uh, feel confident that they're ready to move on into their phases. But there's not I don't do absolutely a hundred percent of it. Um, I I also blend some of the phases at times like they might be ready for some of the next phase but not quite ready for the other uh, and I guess that just comes with with time and experience working with these these cases is that it's not as clear cut as phase one phase two phase three there's this sort of merging of phases that's happening all the way through um, in the last year and a half I've had access to force plates as well which has been absolutely invaluable yeah. for me um, the in, in that I, I used to probably spend more time trying to develop strength, whereas the force plates testing is now showing me that strength is developed in, in most of my athletes sooner than I think it is. It's more power and, and the skill of hopping and jumping that's actually delayed. So uh, the, there's the, the force plates are, are expensive, but if you have access to them, they're, they're absolutely invaluable for, for helping you uh, towards also, that end stage. 
Probably if you have access to the force plates, you have access also to the data that the that for example force plates are made by vault, right? I mean, I'm yeah. not mistaken. Oh, so uh, you have access to all of the vaults, all of the vaults data. You can compare your athlete to other athletes in this kind of situation if he's a basketball player yeah. or a football player, which is awesome. So uh, yeah, I love the force plates and also the handheld di dynamometer. Yeah, I've just recently started using the Dynamo, which is Val. Yeah, I'm using the Dynamo, which is Val's version of the handheld, which is just incredible. It's it's um, a game changer. It's got all the proper attachments for it. You don't have to set up belts and and like you know hold your own body weight and get kicked away from them. You know, it's yeah. it's actually got all the proper attachments. It's got a grip strength. Yeah, it's really good. Um, but the but yeah, I, I think I'm using a variety of different return to play testing. I also absolutely. If you have access to a strength and conditioning coach, use it because as good as we are in that early stage, there's no way I'm I'm good enough in that final stage to be doing all the right stuff with with this athlete to get them. I can get them to training, but once they're in training, that final phase that's going to get them to performance, that's not my job. That's the strength and conditioning coach, in my opinion. And I hand them over, off they go, and then you know that th then they get looked after by them. Um, which... I have a question for you, Charlie. Uh, like, uh, for example, how much would you say, let's say the, the, the rehab is a, is a 12 month rehab, okay, for, for the AC other. How, uh, how, how long would you stay with you? I, I know there's not a, a specific time uh, that you can stay with him, but yeah. how, when do you hand him to your strength and conditioning coach? So it depends. It depends. Sometimes it'd be really early because they they might be, um, they, if, if someone said to me, I want to get through this, do the app absolute best job money is no no problem just get me through then they'll go early to the strength and conditioning coach uh, a lot of the pe people i work with have medical insurance and then they're covered with me but they're not covered with the coach so for those mm. people it's it tends to be a bit more time with me because they just don't want to spend the money on it but i will still push them towards that strength and conditioning if they want to get back into sport especially towards the end and i'll just say look this is a, an investment you should be making but if it's no money no money's no problem then fairly early actually you know maybe even sort of three four months in i'll be saying you'll get something different with the coach than you'll get with me we will complement each other we'll work together on it and at that stage um they will i can then worry a bit less about doing some of the power and the and, and the, the the overall kind of strength programming and i can do more of the the movement quality the the um the more physio -y rehab type stuff yeah Okay. Should we uh, become uh, better in um, strength and conditioning as a physio, especially if you do ACL or long uh, sports physio? Without doubt. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my rehab yeah. is basically strength and conditioning influenced throughout. <laughs> it's, I'm not a strength yeah. and conditioning coach, but my principles are based on strength and conditioning. Yeah. Well, would you, um, I know there has been a bit of debate about the whole leg extension, when to use, when not to use, um, more so post-operatively. Um, what, what's your take on that? Uh, early uh, extend knee, extend the knee early even in active range of movement just to prepare them for the motion uh, banded will come in within a few weeks and then some some smaller range uh, resistance uh, sometimes even with a with a very light kettlebell doing some very very small range in the extensions but, but not always not that some have got more pain some have real significant quads inhibition so in those cases, I might be a bit slower to, to, to bring in it. But if I can trust their knee extension, uh, sorry, their quads engagement, if they've got really good quads engagement, plus their knee calm, and there's no significant pain then quite early. The the evidence around um, the, the amount of force through the ACL graft has, has kind of been disproven um, when we think about how much there is with walking, how much there is with body weight squat. Um, they're, they're all roughly the same. So um, if they can walk and squat, comfortably then they can knee extension in my in my opinion you can yeah i would i would go for the for the first thing i would go for is the knee extension uh, that that's that's crucial i mean in a, any rehab but i want to add something um, that is super important that i find uh, super important in the rehab which is the pre -op if they are going for the surgical treatment the pre-operative rehab this is super important it has helped me a lot in my experience and in my practice 
for example, in, uh, in getting back the knee extension and in getting back the knee flexion, and plus in, in, in uh, engaging the quads and the hammies, it's very important in doing the preoperative rehab. You will get, uh, uh, it will help you a lot in the postoperative uh, rehab. Uh, and I find this extremely crucial. And I find that people should use this more uh, in, their, in their rehab. And they should advise their their. Uh, their athletes to go for the pre-operative rehab or amateurs for the pre-operative rehab instead of uh, going just for the post-operative rehab. Absolutely. Completely yeah. agree. Uh, yeah, the, for, for how long would that be? Six, six weeks. weeks. Six weeks is a good... Uh, At least, yeah, six weeks. Some some might get there a bit sooner, but I say I kind of tend to explain that most people would be about six weeks until they're ready. The surgeons I tend to work with, they, they ask me when I think they're ready now, which is quite nice. Um, they send them to me for the pre-op and they say when they're ready get them booked in and, and then I'll listen to you they they don't they don't really give them a time they just say go and see the physio when he thinks you're ready then you go in um, Do you the, have some the criteria simple, or, 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 so a straight knee a straight knee no knee effusion good quads contraction and um, I start basically line testing them then as well so i've already got some strength measurements pre-op to then compare to so their left and their right side which are sort of surgical and non-surgical side because they'll already be deconditioning on their good side as well so the, the the later you you baseline test them on their good side the the less accurate your your comparison is going to be so i baseline test them early um i'll, I'll and i'll have that probably within the first few weeks after their their kind of prehab starts and the, and the thing i say to, to the patient so they get it is that if you're good in you'll be good out so yeah. they, they tend to bounce out of surgery much better when their knee is less swollen straight and they've already got a bit of uh, strength in their legs yeah can i ask is there any this is just like a, a question i just came up with really um We've seen a lot of uh, some like studies that show placebo surgery versus like actual surgery for like, for example, shoulder, like shoulder arthroscopy or anything like that, decompression surgeries, things like that. Um, have you heard of or do you find it maybe interesting or what are your thoughts on how much of the surgery and the confidence people get because of, oh, they fixed it. My knee should be working now um, yeah. rather than they in my case if you're asking me uh i, I wouldn't go for a placebo surgery uh, on, a, on an athlete of mine you know he will find out eventually i think i think actually he will find out that it, this was there wasn't anything done on his knee plus there is a feeling of giving way so uh, especially in a in the, in the basketball uh, sport so uh, the change of direction on the first time he's going to change direction after the surgery even if we do a lot of a uh, very good physio and, he, uh, and his knee gives way he's going to know that something is wrong uh, that because in the end the athletes even before coming to me they have done their research they are already convinced they know what they want they do they they know what to expect uh, even if I sit down with them, for example, with me, I sit down. The first session with them is not a, 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 a therapy session. It's not a therapeutic session. For me, it's a teaching session. I have a board. I have a chalk. I sit them down. I ask. I explain them. Uh, I explain everything to them. Like we're gonna do this, this, this for like a year. We're gonna go even more uh, a, a year and plus. Uh, uh, we're gonna do this, 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 and I explain every phase. But they have they have already done uh, their research and they know they are not. Uh, stupid people, the athletes. They are not just like uh, medically. They are not stupid. They know their bodies. But I wouldn't go for it. To be and to be to answer your question. Yeah, yeah the, the 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 athlete would. You couldn't do it in the athlete. There's there's the league. The legality wouldn't, wouldn't work. But you could. It would be interesting. I think. I think we would. I'm sure in the future they will study that in the non-athlete, and they would likely see that some some cases do very well because we know that there are a lot of copers. So if, if placebo is essentially increasing your expectation of effect, and we know that some people have surgery because they just expect it to be better. So if, we, if they expect it to be better, they go for surgery and that, that part of it is solved and they go through their rehab like a normal um, non-op case would do and they get better, I think some of them will do really well. Not all of them, but I think some will do really well. So um, I'm sure in the future we'll, we'll have some, some kind of study that looks at this. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I was wondering if uh, ACL is a, such a big operation or such an important ligament, you feel more giving away then. Maybe with the shoulder arthroscopy or the knee arthroscopy is different than an ACL uh, surgery, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not sure. Still, expectations yeah. are very important for sure. Mm. Maybe with the knee arthroscopy is more like uh, it's more doable because it's a less invasive injury. I think you can uh, so uh, so I think it's more doable than the in the knee arthroscopy. Yeah, with non athletes, of course. Yeah, it it might work uh, as as Charlie said. I agree with him. I thought uh, they already did that as a placebo surgery for arthroscopy for the knee. I thought in, in for the meniscus, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. But it's just because like with meniscus or anything in the shoulder, a lot of the time it's um it's like pain that they're trying to get rid of, right? It's not usually, I don't think they've done any placebos on like a labral repair if it was if it was more like instability or anything in the shoulder. So uh, obviously it would be different in the knee because there's actually a structure missing that is giving you a certain degree of stability and and um, strength in the knee, but. I don't know. I'd be curious. I'd be curious. Yeah, I think I think the important thing is that instability is not just structural. You know, there's 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 neuromuscular instability as well. So that's the part that you might get away with. You know, if they have neuromuscular instability with you know quads and hamstrings not not doing their job amongst all, all the other all the muscles in the leg, then that's the part that's rehabable, right? <laughs> and and that's the part that some people are not prepared to to go through. But if they've had this placebo surgery, this sham surgery, you know, who knows? Maybe that bit we could, we could then rehab post sham surgery, and they could end up being a copa. Yeah, for sure. If they have a better condition and better, better neuromuscular uh, function beforehand, then of course uh, they feel better than afterwards. But if they're already very inactive, then they don't have that, and then you really feel they're giving away. I would say. Yeah. yeah, you guys also talked about the patient's activity levels. What do you, uh, how does it change your decision about uh, surgery or non-surgery or how to progress in your rehab if a patient is not so active? Because yeah, you see it also a lot, of course. Uh, for me, it just means you miss out the, the final phase if they're not active. You don't need to do the change of direction stuff. So you, you still want them to be good single leg. You still want them to be strong and and, and symmetrical in strength output you just wouldn't be quite so um comprehensive on on agility and, and explosive power um if they're not uh if they're not trying to get back to those so it just shortens the journey because they don't have to do that final phase but in terms of surgery or not um it it's not as clear-cut as, as it used to be you know athlete must get it non-athlete doesn't need to get it but um it for, for some people who want a bit more clarity on their on their timeline surgery gives them that you know surgery is going to be you have surgery then you go through this journey of you know 9 12 maybe a bit more but non-operatively you have to then take a bit of a risk and say are you going to be a copa and then you have to have surgery if you're not and that's the uncertainty that a lot of athletes won't won't like so that's that's probably the the, the main decision because it's not as clear about arthritis anymore whether they're going to get it or not so it's more about the clarity on the prognosis and if they feel confident to be able to go back to change of direction without a structure without that graft and perhaps also um, if you are as a therapist very experienced in conservative management that also helps of course you're more confident in that just like sur uh, surgeons who do a certain operation a lot they feel very confident and they know exactly what uh, yeah it will um, how long it will take and stuff yeah but the, i uh, thought it wasn't here whether osteoarthritis has really been linked with um with not surgery or surgery i think there there's that showed if anything it was a bit more a little more linked to the the surgical approach than the non-surgical approach mm. Yeah, from, from my understanding, it's that there's some studies show that it, it does a bit, some sh shows that it doesn't a bit. So, I mean, I think one study even said it was the other way around. So I, I think that it, the consensus is still a bit gray. We still don't know for definite. We used to think it, that surgically stabilizing would be less risk, whereas now it's harder to be that, to use that as the argument. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, let's uh, wrap it up um, soon. Um, let's uh, let's uh, uh, end with some <coughs> with some uh, 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 most important tips or general tips that you would give to uh, physios who are doing a lot of uh, ACL rehab or not so much, and they want to get better in it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So I think um, give give the patient the choice. Um, make sure they have good prehab, um, good in, good out, and then post stop. Take your time. So there's no rush post stop. Get the knee calm and settled. You can do a lot of quads activation exercises. You can get that knee settled. Use complex to get the neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Get the quad firing. Um, once you have a quad that's firing, a knee that's calm and, and not and not swollen. The rest of it becomes fairly straightforward. You're then just going through a strength building phase uh, into a, a single leg phase into a dynamic sort of plyometric phase. So the rest of it's easy if the start is good. So take your time and um, yeah, don't rush through even when you're, you're feeling a bit impatient with it. Take your time. As for me, I would love to uh, everything that Charlie said, and I would add like be honest. At, at, uh, since the beginning with the with the with your patient tell them everything with honesty and don't change uh, your your perspective from it uh, depending on him don't be don't rush into things just like charlie said and uh, we have to so we have to go into more into strength and conditioning we have to have this baggage with us also uh, physios should do this should go for strength and conditioning uh, because it's super, super important now especially if you're going with athletes if you're treating athletes it's super important Yeah, I think you're. I I agree <laughs> with what they said. Um, no, I think it's super important um, to to know your strength and conditioning basics as well. Um, I would also say for for myself, it helped to kind of follow some protocols out there. Unfortunately, there's a lot more post op protocols out there than I could like barely find any conservatives. And my first ACL I treated outside uh, of uni was conservative management. Um, so it's 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 a bit overwhelming sometimes. But I think as long as you go after the patient, like don't get too caught up on w the protocol and what should you do, like use it as a general guideline. But I think it's very important to look at what can the patient do, what are they comfortable with, and also at the same time not imposing your discomfort or beliefs onto the patient like if you're hesitant about things it can very easily make them more insecure about their knee so finding that right balance of uh of trusting in their knee so that they can trust in their knee um and and yeah basically just following um what the individual can do and what they want to achieve super important to tailor it to them can i just offer one last one as well so if and this is really important if you're not testing you're guessing so yeah 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 that's okay. super so, important yeah there's you can't just be eyeballing range of movement you can't just be feeling manual muscle testing you know the oxford you, you can't <laughs> you can't do that it's not good enough you've got to be using some kind of strength metric if you haven't got equipment use you know single leg sit to stand single leg elevated bridge capacity there is a way it's not quite as good but i and actually the the handheld dynamometers these days are pretty cheap if you haven't got one look into it they're cheap enough now for everyone to to have one in their clinic i totally agree with you are force plays necessary for you or, or you think it's not necessary they've become it for me but they, but i don't think necessarily they are for everyone i i've, I've just got a, a bit um, used to using them now and i'd struggle without uh, i think they're too expensive to be recommending them for everyone but maybe even find a clinic that does have them and, and and you get them to a certain stage and then you know outsource it just say go and get the testing yeah. done and i'll have the report back you might find somewhere nearby that's got it and you can just use them for that service you don't need it for all of it mm -hmm. yeah i also like what kino was saying in the beginning only explanation because it also shows it shows your competence shows that you're confident and it shows uh, it gives a great expectation also like the patient knows exactly what's going on what's going to be so you don't have to uh, keep their or it improves their uh, therapeutic alliance with you so yeah i think that's a great uh, thing indeed here to make it very clear great explanation and to show that you are a competent clinician which uh, is very important of course it shows that you've been there already also so, so uh, it shows that you've been there already 
that you've yeah. done this already. So that way the, uh, the, the patient gets more comfortable with you. He's more like relieved now. Mm -hmm. And plus he can see it. You can, he can visualize his own path now, what he's going to do, what he's going to go through. So the, the visualization of his own path is really, um, how do we say it? It's like soothing for him, you know, it calms him down. Yeah, because sorry. most, almost, oh, oh, sorry, Kia. Sorry, I just said setting expectations, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because all patients come in here almost with uh, with anxiety, worries, and fear. You know, if you can reduce that, it, it's uh, very important for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, that's a great uh, ending. I think uh, we have a great a lot of great tips. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, thanks everyone. I'm just glad my camera held up today. I, it was a bit of a disaster on my first attempt two weeks ago. So yeah, I'm just pleased that worked this time around. <laughs> hey, your mic also, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it seems like Zoom uh, works a little bit better than uh, what we used before indeed, yeah. All right, um, thanks. I'll wrap this up. And Thank thanks everybody guys. for watching also. Okay, Have enjoy the rest of the weekend, everyone. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Charlie loved your input, by the way. Uh, thanks, Ken and yours as well. Uh, sounds like you've got a great cohort there with the basketball group. So that's cool. I, yeah. I do wish I worked yeah. with more athletes. So I've got a lot of weekend warriors my end, but but yeah, some athletes, but mostly mostly the weekend warrior. Yeah, I do wish I worked with more weekend warriors because uh, <laughs> the athletes uh, the athletes sometimes are a bit. Uh, you can have some of mine expectations yeah they're a bit too much to handle sometimes and they want to do stuff their own way because they know that they're athletes and it's not that easy to handling them and managing them so sorry guys yeah. sorry we are still live now uh, i have to end ah. this meeting i think ah. <laughs> sorry about that there we go sorry. no no worries it's nothing first, first time with zoom uh, <laughs> i'll um i'll end this meeting yeah but uh, of course we can always uh talk later or you get you guys can uh, talk later the, yourself, yeah sure yeah. sure yeah, reach sure. out if you need to, Keenan. It'd be good to chat again. But thanks, yeah, everyone. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave the meeting. Bye -bye. See you all.